Uh, cosmology of consciousness. Uh, I personally believe that no one, is, the scientific community is not going to accept what we do until there's another scientific revolution. That's it. Those of you who were with us last night at dinner know that I believe the scientific revolution has always started. And it's going to come from physics, who is it's going to come from physics, which is that definition for the first time of what matter is, and that's due to the crises of dark matter and dark energy. And from <coughs> the other half, which is consciousness, because I don't think we can know what consciousness, is, or we can't know what matter is until we understand the consciousness that is sensing and interpreting what we sense. So it's going to be a, du it's going to be a dual revolution. And so this talk, a cosmology of consciousness, combining the two, building a pragmatic model of anomalies from scratch. Uh, get right into it. Everyone, how many of you have ever had a beginning physics class and you go and the professor tells you that this table is not solid and I am not solid? Because the only solid thing in this table is the uh, nucleus of the atom and the electrons themselves. This is 99.9% .9 empty space, so am I. Then why can't I put my hand through here? Because electrostatic repulsion. We are not material bodies. We are combination of electric fields, magnetic fields, with little dots of matter at the center. We're more electromagnetic than we are matter. That's the basis of my whole theory, right there. Let me explain. We start off with the Newtonian paradigm. The first equation up the top is called the Lorentz equation. This is the electromagnetic force is equal to charge moving through an electric field plus the charge moving at speed B creating a magnetic field around the beam which interacts with the ambient electric field B. Then, of course, that's just Newton's gravitational equation. F is equal to mg. Electric and gravitational fields are scalar potential fields. B is a vector potential field. I don't have to explain that because it's already been done for me. So <laughs> we'll do a short cut there. The next step is the classical paradigm. F is equal to MG is turned into general relativity, space-time curvature. Instead of having a force, you have a particle moving at constant speed along the geodesic through curved space on the left, and then on the right, the mass becomes a matter energy tensor, stress tensor. Next step, the Kaluza theory. General relativity has a four-dimensional space-time. Kaluza comes along in 1921 and has a mathematical, not a physical, but a mathematical fifth dimension. And he's able to unify Einstein's equation with Lorentz equation, in essence. He drives both fields from a single field. Again, that is the basis of my, my theory. Now, first of all, you've heard of Kaluza before, but it's Kaluza Klein, because the super screen people use the Kaluza Klein theory. I'm not using Kaluza Klein, I'm using Kaluza. It's his theory. All Klein did was tweak a little bit and try and explain the quantum. So I'm just using the Kaluza theory, as Einstein himself did in the 1930s. I'm making two proposals. Space is four dimensional, although the fourth dimension is different from the other three, meaning it's not as isotropic with the other three. Space-time curvature then becomes an extrinsic property. Space-time is curved in the higher fourth dimension. Uh, when you're talking about space-time, then it's five-dimensional, with the extra-dimensional being spatial light. Our three-dimensional space of normal experience is an embedded sheet within this overall four-dimensional space. This turns the clues of math model into a physical model. Now, the clues of five theory, super string theory people, they're trying to do that, but according to them, the fourth dimension is compactified. It's the plan plan. No, my fourth dimension, as far as I can figure, we are all extended to an extent of 13.22 billion light years in the fourth dimension. But our material bodies are stuck within the sheet. That extension is extension of our material bodies to our true actual matter, matter stuck in the sheet. Now, light and mind and consciousness are chaotic complexities that have emerged through evolutionary processes within the sheet. Oh, sorry. Then there is ample evidence already in classical physics of the fourth dimension space. I wrote an article here, Three Logical Proofs, in the JSE, 
uh, last winter. So the articles that I want to check with, but basically, there's a fourth dimensional space according to the electromagnetic theory, because that QB cross B, which gives you the magnetic force, you have a three space cross a three space, which gives you a four dimensional space. Some of the original thinkers on electromagnetic adopted that, but Maxwell and Kelvin did not. That's why we're stuck with three dimensional electromagnetism. Clifford and others said, no, it's four dimensional. And of course, we have that vector potential the magnetic field, this uh, electromagnetic vector potential, it's also called the magnetic potential. For those of you who don't know, electric potential is volts. Magnetic potential, if they could measure it, which they've never been able to, although it's there, they know it's there, they can't measure it, would be a magnetic volt. We're all, we're all familiar with potential. So they've never been able to measure the magnetic volt, although certain experiments like the Haranoff Bohm experiment, that's what causes the Armand Bohm effect that was shown earlier by another uh, speaker. So now we have my theory that the, we're patterns. We're patterns of space-time curvature. But the pattern, the variations of that pattern would be the quantum level. Whoops. The scalar potential for gravity is the life pattern. The scalar potential for electricity is the mind pattern, and the vector potential is the consciousness pattern. So I said these would be very, very extremely complex patterns. Every little movement of every little electron in every little chemical process in our body generates a corresponding magnetic field. Our whole body is that electric field, and that's what uh, mind is. Our whole body has corresponding magnetic field, and that's what consciousness is. Now, there are certain consequences of this model. First one being that all life, the simplest form of life, has a pre-emergent mind and a pre-emergent consciousness. They emerge as complexities, true mind, true consciousness, or when I say consciousness, I mean human level consciousness, emerge as complexity through evolution. Um, mind emerges naturally as an organ, as an organism evolves to the point that needs a brain to control the rest of the functions in its body, the functions of the its body. So mind emerges as the higher dimensional extension when brain emerges within the material body and sheet. Mind is a stable complexity that then collects and utilizes memories. At first, when some organism, living organism develops mind through emergence, it collects memories, but they're scattered, chaotic memories. Then as it learns more and more, those memories start forming patterns, and patterns within patterns, and patterns within patterns. Then it begins stepping up evolutionary in pre-emergent consciousness. Then consciousness finally emerges as the memories form their own stable complexity. This emergence occurs, the emergence of human-like consciousness occurs when memories have grown complex enough to distinguish between space-time locality Self and the rest of the environment, which is space time non locality. That's putting in physics terms. So I'm using physics to actually explain why consciousness is an awareness of self. There's a self and there's the rest of the universe. Now, the thing is, I have to say where memories come from. It's not that hard. You're going to get a theory now. How many of you have ever heard of the uh, Hamoff Penrose model? Hameroff discovered that microtubules deal with memory. Hameroff, in his model, says it's quantum. I say, no, it's electromagnetic. I owe him the microtubules. Yes, that's fantastic. And more and more evidence is uh, pointing to microtubules as a source of memory. But it's electromagnetic. Uh, memories form a specific four-dimensional magnetic Path, potential pattern in our extensions into the higher fourth dimension of space. Memories form from electromagnetic longitudinal waves, not transverse waves, longitudinal waves. I'll explain them in a minute. Microtubules are small induction coils or transceivers, radio transceivers. They emit and receive ordinary transverse electromagnetic waves, which allows coherence between all the patterns of microtubules in a neuron with all the other neurons. Like microtubules in one neuron, 
will resonate with light microtubules in another neuron. You have this vast pattern. Say I'm looking, I look at that light. It stimulates a neuron. Electric potential goes up a neuron. As it goes up, it causes the microtubules here to fire south and north. Now the path around the microtubule, they have two um, ionic states, alpha and beta. If they fire alpha, they go alpha, 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 in a spiral motion. Any electric current traveling in a spiral motion around the cylinder is an inductor, an electromagnetic inductor. Simple physics. If, it's, if the axons, if the microtubules are not inductors, then physics has to explain why. It's that simple. They are. But at the same time, the outer wall is a capacitor. So you have a couple of capacitor and an inductor. An LRC circuit, the basic tuning circuit for all electrons. So every one of those microtubules is a radio transceiver. Now in this electromagnetic wave, which allows coherence in the brain, that's the thing the Hammeroff Penrose model is missing. They can't count for coherence. Hammeroff is squares. Consciousness is in a single microtube, a quantum effect, but he can't get coherence. Here's the coherence, right here, simple electro, but he refuses to talk about anything classic. I'll convince him yet. Um, so memories are made of this. You go get coherence from the transverse wave, but there's another prediction from the actual electromagnetics that there are also longitudinal waves. It's a mathematic reality, but science just ignores them because they've never discovered them. They've never discovered them because the longitudinal waves spread into the fourth dimension, where the potential vectors are that we can't measure. So, the, at the same time they cause coherence with the transverse wave, the longitudinal wave goes and sets up the pattern in our extension in the higher dimension. Patterns gather, patterns gather, patterns gather until we recognize space time, and then you have a all of a sudden a formation of complexity, and that is human like brain. Now, with this, I can very easily explain memory storage, I just did, memory retrieval, and I look back at that light, it blinds me again, the signal goes up my neuron, sets the resonances in, the, uh, in, the, in my uh, fiber bundle, the optic nerves. They go back up into the fourth dimension where it's stored. Well, that's already there. Ding, 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 ding. I've just recognized. This explains simple recognition. I close my eyes. I stimulate, mentally I stimulate, that pattern. That pattern then goes down, sets off the optical nerve, and I have a picture in my mind of the lights. Recall. This model easily explains all three. Oops. Now, oh, the memory field structure pattern would essentially be an emergent hologram. If we look at it from a four-dimensional point of view, it would be a four-dimensional hologram. We'll call free from another say, memory is a hologram. This fits it perfectly. They're looking for a three-dimensional hologram inside your skull. No. Now, as I said, mind and consciousness are the whole body. It's just that in the brain, we have the concentration of neurons that allows us to communicate effectively with them. But technically, the nerves go all through the body, so you have microtubules all through the body, so they're added to the pattern. So technically, mind and consciousness, the whole body, just this is the radio transceiver amplifier controller that works with them directly. Now, we have the three dimensions here, we have the four dimensions here. That means the space-time curvature becomes extrinsic to three-dimensional space-time. Now, this also allows me to explain dark matter. The dark matter halo that causes the constant speeds of star systems and spiral arms of the galaxies cannot be part particular. They, they try to say that the dark matter halo around the galaxies is some kind of exotic particles like axions or something. Can't be, because they, get, they are gravitational. If they're gravitational, they'd be sucked into the core. They wouldn't be sticking out around the edge. So they can't be part of particular. 
the fact that they form around the edge of the galaxy means that somehow they're acting centripetally. That normal gravity, F equals mg, Einstein's general relativity, normal gravity has some type of a centripetal component along with the direct point-to-point -point component that we normally think of. The only possibility then is to have the centripetal component. Right here. Just an, through analogy, it acts just like magnetism. That's the way magnetism works, around the moving body. So we have MV cross gamma, where gamma is the collective gravitational wave from the rest of the universe. MV is just the momentum that comes from the gravitational force. Now, when I take this MV cross gamma, that graphs exactly like the actual speeds of stars and galaxies. It gives me the exact same graph that we read in textbooks for galaxy, star galaxy speeds. But it also gives me a vector potential. Now we not only have a gravitational scalar potential, we have a gravitational vector potential. Then when, then when matter reacts with the vector potential, it becomes a potential energy, and it changes to kinetic energy, as in the increasing rate of expansion of the universe. This gives me Mach's principle. MV plus gamma is just a mathematical form of Mach's principle, which has been known for about 140 years now. It's common in science, but it's never been put in mathematics. Now it has. But it also gives me... Oops. I can't get forward and backwards straight. No, I'm not going to go back too far. It also gives me that potential energy, which is nothing other than dark energy. The extrinsic, the extra, extrinsic curvature due to that MV cut gamma gives me the dark matter. So this simple equation accounts perfectly for dark matter and dark energy. And I, this on the dark matter, dark energy, I've been presenting this for a year and a half now at APS meetings, and they're finally starting to listen, but with small groups of 10 people. Eventually, though, more will listen to me. You put all this together, the five-dimensional field theory becomes a single field theory. The four-dimensional space, five-dimensional space time is filled with a single field. That's the field that Einstein was looking for. And everything we know, matter, everything, is nothing more than field structures within this. I put in, make substitute for the MD with the Broglie's equation. I have H lambda cross gamma, and that's the elusive quantum gravity that scientists have been looking for for the past 50 or 60 years. Very simple, straightforward. The single field that gives me connectivity, or as they call it, quantum theory, entanglement. Here's the, this is the three dimensional sheet, this is fifth dimension time and out. Here's the brain and the body, which are strictly three dimensional, giving more. Light, sensory input to the brain, gives us fine memories and consciousness up here in the, in the extended fifth dimension. Well, if we get sensory input here, why can't we get sensory input here from consciousness, conscious mind to mind? Because that's a real physical quantity. There's your ESP, telepathy, everything there. Consciousness, extracted is something cheap without going to the brain and body. There's telekinesis and all that stuff, remote viewing. So the connectivity gives me side. This is the mechanism of side. When the body dies, when the person dies, oops, all that I'm losing is this part, mind and consciousness are still there. So this gives me the afterlife. Now, when a body dies, the force of gravity goes. Here, magnetic gravity, the particles go, but we left with it. Still, you still have the electric field, the magnetic field. Because the third and fourth parts of Maxwell's law say that, it, that a varying electric field gives you a magnetic field, and a varying magnetic field gives you an electric field. So those two complexities become mutually coherent, <coughs> reinforcing each other, which means they survive after the body dies. The same way if I wiggle an electron here at some frequency, I give off a light wave at that same frequency. When I stop wiggling that electron, the light wave continues out through space, independent. Same thing here. You can see they're mutually coherent right here because of Maxwell's third and fourth law. So Maxwell's third and fourth law in this model actually requires that mind and consciousness survive. Yeah. So.
Summary, we are made up of matter energy field, the electric field, and the magnetic field. All material bodies are a combination of these. Living bodies differ only in the fact that the complexities have emerged from these fundamental fields. The matter energy field forms light, which is primary. The E field forms uh, brain mind, which is secondary consciousness, comes from the B field, that's tertiary. Each level that organizes those below emergence, which gives me, if I go to apply it, all those big evolutionary leaps, uh, like the Cambrian explosion that evolutionists can't, can't explain. They're just the next step in complexity, because once it evolves to that complexity, the, cup, the higher level rules over the material level, giving us the Cambrian explosion and the development of the human brain, which evolutionists can't explain. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. I'm scratching my head at least. <laughs> uh, let's take uh, back there first. Is there a room? Is there a room at all for forgetting for getting things? Uh, yes, actually, I have a model of Alzheimer's, the ultimate forgetting. Um, they've discovered in Alzheimer's that what happens is you have a breakdown within the neuron. I've heard various things, but basically the microtubules become unwrapped. And they no longer transmit or receivers. So they can't store new memories or retrieve old memories. So basically, if you're forgetting, then the I would say there's something wrong with microtubules, all forms of senility and everything. 